<clears throat> Good morning, Kaisho and Kalimera. So um, while we're waiting for the slides, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, it's, it's a fascinating audience, what, what you have here. It shows, I think, the importance of, of a community, a vet community. And um, congratulations to the, to the organizers, to the World Federation of Colleges and Polytechnics, to Technica, to the Basque uh, government, and to all of you who contributed to this, to this event. Today I will, um, I will talk to you uh, about a topic which we don't want to talk about. Uh, it's about war. War that is happening in a country not far from where we are in Europe, in Ukraine, because of an invasion. Um, and of course, it's, it's a sad topic to talk in the 21st century. But there is a link, of course, when you have a war and the loss of, of human lives, the, the damage and all that. There is also, of course, migrants and, and refugees. And um, there is a role for education. There is a role for education to prevent the war from happening, obviously. But there is a ro role for education training to, to mitigate, to respond to the, the negative impact of, of war. I will talk about that. I will show some figures. And I will describe the work we do uh, together with Ukraine as a European agency to, to, to help. Um, respond to this impact of war. Before I go to the slides where I show some figures, um, let me say one word about uh, my agency. So it's a European agency, it's called European Training Foundation. You can Google it, it's very easy, ETF. It exists for almost 30 years. European agencies, they are um, designed and built by the European Union to support decentralized actions. So actions that are not often happening from the center, from the headquarters, from Brussels. My agency is uh, working in actions related to human capital development, especially VAT. But there is one particular thing about my agency compared to all the other agencies that exist, the European agencies. We work in the external dimension of policies. This means that we work for the EU, but with countries outside the EU. So we work with 29 countries outside the EU. I could name a few just to get a picture. Um, we work with Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, so on. We work with Eastern neighborhood countries, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Belarus, Armenia, Azerbaijan. We work with countries that are uh, candidate countries, uh, to the EU, like Serbia, like Turkey, like Albania, Montenegro, and we work with uh, North Africa and uh, East Mediterranean, Israel, Jordan, Morocco, Tunisia, Libya, and so on. 29 countries altogether, and that's my agency. Now, when we say we work in human capital development, it means that we discuss with the countries what could be let's say, um, the way forward when it comes to human capital development, what are the needs, and how we uh, work with other uh, stakeholders in the country to help the governments deliver those, 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 uh, in those needs. We do the same for Ukraine. And we've been working with Ukraine for many, many years now. In fact, we are one of those EU agencies that we uh, employ people from countries outside the EU, and in my agency we have 135 uh, people. Um, five colleagues are actually from Ukraine. So, with that as an introduction, let me go to the first slide. One of the things we do to address human capital development is to, um, of course, to build knowledge, and you have heard perhaps some of my colleagues these days from ETF talking about centers of vocational excellence. We have a big network there. And through that network, 
and through the cooperation with countries and other centers of excellence like Technica, we built our expertise, our knowledge in certain areas. So accumulation of knowledge is fundamental for my agency, is fundamental to support policies, obviously. The second is uh, data. You need data in order to do uh, to advise, you need to have the right data, you need to, to have the intelligence, you need to be able to contextualize the theory, the intelligence you have, the knowledge you have into the, to the right country, to the right place. And the third one is policy advice. We do policy advice. So if you merge those two together, intelligence and uh, knowledge, then of course we are able to contextualize and upon request offer advice to the different countries we work with. So what you see here it comes through this idea of building our um, intelligence. And of course, the data you see and you will see, they're not only our data. They're data that are coming from, are coming from big organizations like ILO, but also from the country, from Ukraine, uh, in cooperation with the Ministry of Education. So the first slide, it, it shows the, the figures when it comes to, to refugees. 6.8 million is actually not the number of refugees, but the, 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 um, the movement is the number of the movement. You see the damaged and destroyed education facilities, 1,888. You, you may think that around 900 of those are actually, well, not of the damaged one, but in Ukraine you have more or less 900 uh, vet uh, centers. So one part of that you will see that it's actually uh, vet. At, uh, institutions. And you see, of course, the di direct damage in education, uh, 1.9 billion euros. The second uh, slide shows how, um, because it's important to have this picture you know, in able to, to be in a position to put a proposal for the country, so you need to have these figures. It shows how many of those um, movements are done internally, how many will go and not come back. And many of the countries around Ukraine today, they, they host many people and the, school, the new school year will start soon. And it's very difficult also for the countries around Ukraine to estimate what will be the needs to, to accommodate refugees and young people into the education system. Human uh, capital and education, again, you can see figures. I will not go through all of them because you will have the presentations later on. You can have a look. You can see how that is distributed in the different regions of Ukraine, especially in the east, where the, the war is more severe. Uh, you can see the vet schools completely destroyed in some cases. U Ukraine is building these days um, with the support of, of different organizations, schools outside Ukraine in cooperation with neighboring countries to accommodate students who have left the country, learners who have left the country. And you see the damaged vet schools, 98 out of around 900 schools in, in Ukraine. And the map of Ukraine showing, let's say, where the situation is more severe we are in continuous contact with the, with the Ministry of Education and Science of, of Ukraine, uh, but also other stakeholders in the country, other international organizations which are active in the country. And it's impressive that even in the first days oops, of the war, um, they were able to, to respond and, and, and communicate and put plans in place. And, um, think of the next day, and th that's an impressive achievement by, by itself. This, this slide is quite interesting uh, because it shows the employment characteristics of internally displaced persons, and I'm, I'm using these particular slides because um, I will talk about our package afterwards, what, what we actually do in Ukraine, and you need to have these figures in mind to be able to see what, why we put that proposal forward. How many lost their jobs? How many didn't have a job before? That, that's, that's important because the, the figures, they show a picture, a very clear picture of what is happening on the ground, but they don't show the whole picture, of course, because often we tend to think that the situation was perfect before. So it shows 
how difficult the situation is today, but then of course you need to take account that if you want to build, uh, recover after the war, some things need to be done in a different way. And that's, that's important to, to be considered. This slide comes from ILO. It's interesting because it shows, again, the characteristics of refugee population. So who are those who left? And what does it mean for their uh, employment outside Ukraine? How easy for a farmer, for example, to, to leave the country? Can that person do the same job easily somewhere else? If a person is working on a, um, through, through digital means, isn't it easy to move the country and, and, and work in another place using a platform? In fact, many of the meetings we have with officials from the ministry, they're happening from remote places because exactly they can be connected and they can um, do the job you know, not from their usual place. And here I come now to the ETF response. I have to say that we work in very close cooperation with, of course, the European Commission. So every proposal we put in place is in co cooperation with, with the services of the European Commission, but also with the country. So there is a negotiation, there is an ongoing discussion where we feel we can contribute, where we feel we can help to, to liaise with others, to bring others into the, uh, in, in, into the picture, and where there are the immediate needs. So the first thing we've done in cooperation with the, with the ministry is to look into an emergency package. Emergency means to address the most urgent needs when it comes to education and training, and where, of course, you can deliver something. So you will see in a minute where we've done in that package. The second one is to engage already from now into the proposal for recovery. And there are platforms already discussing about the next day, and we're involved in that. People to people support, it's always crucial. Even through small donations, we're giving five laptops in one of the, in one of the center that will, will open uh, now in the next few weeks in, in, in Poland that will, ac will accommodate some students from, from, from Ukraine. Colleagues, people in the, in the city, in Turin, they are helping, and ETF is coordinating that. Redirection of planned activities. It's important when you have a situation like that not to overburden the situation on the ground. There are severe needs, there are priorities, you have to respect that. So anything else that can wait, can wait. Regular coordination, I said that already, and working with the neighbors, with the neighboring countries, that's very important, and in ETF, we have this um, everyday coordination with countries around Ukraine, exactly to see how um, actions could be coordinated. So this slide shows a bit what, what we do. Some things, they are not the obvious ones, but they are very important, and the country said yes, despite the situation, we want to do them. For example, they want to, to, to keep working on collecting data for the labor market. They are interested in that because under the, the, the severe conditions, they still want to see where the opportunities are for people to, to, to find jobs or um, uh, to, look, to look for jobs. So we, we do that. They're interested in centers of excellence, and they've been very active before the war, especially with, with a sense of excellence working in the green transition. They want to continue to do that. We thought maybe not now, maybe... No, 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 we want to be involved. We want to continue. We want to do, to the extent that is possible, we want to continue life. So they, they are involved. And you see there uh, other um, exercises, other, other uh, tasks we do, like the Torino process, where we, 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 we involve different stakeholders in the country to uh, see what is the situation, and based on that, to build our intelligence and uh, provide uh, support. So the emergency package. The emergency package has two elements, and it's already uh, in implementation. I invite you all to, to, to go to our website, Google European Training Foundation, ETF. You will see on the front page the emergency package. It has two, um, two elements. The first one is, is a resource uh, hub, and this is for people who left the country. It's for refugees. So, they go to different countries, they need to have their credentials, they need to have their qualifications recognized. It's an immediate measure, so um, there, is, there is a portal that allows them to do that. As of, um, of last week, 
uh, ESCO, the, um, the European tool on, on skills, competences, and, and, and uh, occupations, is actually translated with our support together with the European Commission in Ukrainian as well, so the Ukrainian people can use it. Um, it's, it's very, very important. So that, that's the first part of, of the package, where we support, let's say, the, uh, the employment of Ukrainian refugees. And many other organizations uh, work in that. It's not, I mean, we, we're a small uh, organization as such, but um, I, I think that had an important impact. The second one is about learners. War is happening today. One of the immediate uh, impacts is, of course, people to be outside of, 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 of school, outside of learning, on the site. So you need to gradually try to bring back these people. And if you have, let's say, already online platforms, on, or already online courses, to do that, that, that's good news. If you don't, then you need to build that. So we, we're working with the authorities to actually bring this, uh, to, to, to develop these courses. We do that in cooperation with, with other countries where they have similar, let's say, interests and, and, and courses. We are trying to link those with micro-credentials so they can do even small courses and immediately have something in hand that will allow them to get a job. So that's the second part of the package um, for the learners and for the, um, um, for the job seekers outside uh, Ukraine. The day after. Again, these are estimates. They are not coming from us about the reconstruction and infrastructure. Um, there is already a big platform in place. Um, Ukraine, of course, leading that discussion on how things should um, start, um, you know, start planning for the next day and, and coordinate among many, many um, stakeholders that are involved. The proposals, um, the learning losses because of the war, because of the people outside schools, because of the people that cannot um, continue their, their learning. We had interviews with students who, in a very tragic way, they were describing their, um, the fact that one day they had a normal student life, and then the next day they were in a situation of a war. And what do you do? You, you, your, your future immediately is, is so blurred. So there, there is, there is um, a loss in, in learning there, like, like we had with the COVID pandemic. There, there, was, there was a loss there as well. And this comes right after that. And this is the ETF proposal for the recovery. This is my, my last slide. Um, it's a big proposal. I just uh, saved a few uh, paragraphs here. It's something that we discuss with, with the country at the moment as we speak. It's one small, small part of the recovery plan for Ukraine. But the idea there is um, to start fresh when the situation allows. Pick up those points that need to be fixed. Some, some of them, they were already in, in a difficult situation before the war. Um, Ukraine, for example, wanted before the war to optimize the number of vet schools they have in Ukraine those 900 centers, they wanted to reduce their numbers and create clusters. So now, with the recovery, we should start from that point and, and make sure that things are, are on the right track. That was my presentation. I hope I, I tried to give a picture of, of, of the situation on the ground, but also what could be the needs and, and the work we do. Um, from our side as a European agency, but I think talking about um, a vet community, this is, um, this is a topic that concerns everybody. Thank you for your attention.